In the ominous skies over Europe, as World War II's storm clouds gathered, there loomed a symbol of fear and destruction, the Luftwaffe, Nazi Germany's formidable air force. Founded in 1935 under the menacing shadow of Hermann Göring, this aerial juggernaut played a pivotal role in the Blitzkrieg tactics that swept across the continent. But it was in the skies above cities like London, during the harrowing period of the Blitz in 1940, where the Luftwaffe left its most indelible and ruthless mark. Imagine the deafening roar of Messerschmitt fighters and Heinkel bombers as they rained down fire and brimstone, turning night into day with their incendiary payloads. The Luftwaffe, in its relentless pursuit of dominance, not only bombarded military targets, but also unleashed terror on civilian populations. Over 20,000 civilians perished under the relentless bombardment. Cities crumbled under their wrath. Coventry and London, including the iconic St. Paul's Cathedral, was engulfed in flames and debris. Beyond Britain's shores, the Luftwaffe's shadow extended to Spain during the Spanish Civil War. The bombing of Guernica on April 26, 1937, stands as a grim testament to their cruelty. This unprovoked attack on a non-military target resulted in hundreds of civilian deaths, a tragedy immortalized in Pablo Picasso's haunting painting Guernica. The Luftwaffe's callousness was further exemplified in their treatment of captured Royal Air Force pilots. Contrary to the Geneva Convention, many were executed or sent to notorious prisoner of war camps like Stalag Luft III, known for the great escape of March 1944, where 76 airmen audaciously fled, though most were recaptured and 50 executed. As Adolf Galland, a famed Luftwaffe fighter ace, once reflected with a blend of pride and remorse, we fought, we bled, under the very delusion that we were the masters of the skies. These words poignantly capture the conflicted spirit of the Luftwaffe pilots, who despite their skills and bravery, were ultimately instruments in a war of unprecedented horror and destruction. Join us as we delve into the chilling details of their reign of terror, exploring the depths of despair and the heights of courage. Welcome to the Diary of Julius Caesar. The Soaring Hawk, the rise and transformation of the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe, a name synonymous with aerial prowess, emerged not just as a military force, but as a symbol of innovation and strategy in the tumultuous skies of the early to mid 20th century. Its inception, evolution and eventual role in World War II illustrate a journey marked by technological leaps, tactical reinventions and profound historical implications. The roots of the Luftwaffe can be traced back to the aftermath of World War I. The Treaty of Versailles in 1919 imposed strict prohibitions on Germany's ability to maintain an air force. However, the seeds of defiance and ingenuity were already sown. In clandestine fashion, Germany began to rebuild its aerial capabilities, using facilities in the Soviet Union to train pilots and develop aircraft in secret. This period was marked by a blend of subterfuge and innovation, laying the groundwork for what would become a formidable aerial force. The official birth of the Luftwaffe came in 1935 under the aegis of the Nazi regime. Hermann Göring, a decorated World War I pilot and influential Nazi official, played a pivotal role in its establishment. The Luftwaffe quickly became a cornerstone of Hitler's rearmament plans, growing at a pace that stunned the world. By 1939, the Luftwaffe had grown to nearly 4,000 aircraft, including the formidable Heinkel He 111 bomber, which played a key role in the Blitzkrieg tactics. The Messerschmitt Bf 109, a symbol of Luftwaffe's might, became one of the most produced fighter aircraft in history, with over 33,000 units built. The early years of World War II saw the Luftwaffe's zenith. Its doctrine of Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War, demonstrated the devastating effectiveness of air power when combined with fast-moving ground forces. The invasion of Poland in September 1939 showcased its devastating effectiveness. The Stuka dive bomber, with its characteristic wailing siren, became a symbol of terror and precision. Poland fell within weeks, and in 1940, France succumbed in just six weeks, partly due to the Luftwaffe's relentless air superiority. 
However, it was the Battle of Britain in 1940, where the Luftwaffe faced its first major setback. Despite outnumbering the RAF, the Luftwaffe failed to achieve air supremacy. The RAF's strategic use of radar and the resilience of pilots like Douglas Bader, who despite losing both legs in a pre-war flying accident, became a flying ace, turned the tide. Winston Churchill's famous quote, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few, aptly described the RAF's heroic defense. As the war progressed, the Luftwaffe found itself stretched on multiple fronts. The invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, Operation Barbarossa, saw initial successes. But the vast distances, harsh weather, and the resilience of the Soviet forces gradually eroded the Luftwaffe's effectiveness. Notably, the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942 was a brutal reminder of the Luftwaffe's overextension, where despite delivering thousands of tons of supplies, it failed to prevent the encirclement and eventual surrender of German forces. Technologically, the Luftwaffe continued to innovate. The introduction of the Messerschmitt Mi-262, the world's first operational jet-powered fighter aircraft jet in 1944, capable of speeds up to 540 miles per hour, was a significant advancement. However, it was too little, too late. The combined Allied bombing campaigns, notably the US Army Air Forces by day and the RAF by night, began to take a toll on German industry and the Luftwaffe's ability to replenish its losses. By 1945, the Luftwaffe was a shadow of its former self. Shortages of fuel, aircraft and trained pilots, along with the relentless Allied advance, had significantly diminished its capacity. The final months of the war saw the Luftwaffe engaging in desperate tactics, including the use of the Volkssturm, a militia comprising of elderly men and young boys, in a futile attempt to stem the tide. Wings of the Reich, pioneering advances in Luftwaffe aircraft technology. During the tumultuous years of World War II, the Luftwaffe stood at the forefront of aviation technology, introducing aircraft that were not just marvels of engineering, but also harbingers of a new era in aerial warfare. The development of these aircraft by the Luftwaffe was driven by a relentless pursuit of superiority in the skies, resulting in some of the most iconic and advanced warplanes of the time. The Messerschmitt Bf 109 was not just a fighter, it was a symbol of the Luftwaffe's strength. First flown in 1935 and introduced in 1937, it became one of the most advanced fighters of its time. The Bf 109's design, featuring a Daimler-Benz DB601 engine, allowed it to reach speeds up to 640 km per h, 398 miles per hour. Adolf Galland, a prominent Luftwaffe ace, famously said about the BF-109, it was as if an angel is pushing you. The Fokker Wolf Fu-190, introduced in 1941, was a testament to German engineering. Its radial BMW 801 engine was a departure from the inline engines commonly used in German fighters. This gave the FW-190 a significant power boost, especially at lower altitudes. Its introduction on the Western Front in late 1941 provided a rude shock to the RAF as it outperformed the Spitfires at that time. Kurt Tank, its designer, had created a versatile and formidable aircraft which served in multiple roles throughout the war. The Junkers Ju-87 Stuka, with its distinctive gull wings and wailing siren, became an icon of the early war years. Its first combat test was during the Spanish Civil War in 1936, where it proved its effectiveness in dive bombing. The psychological impact of its siren, designed to instill fear, was as much a weapon as the bombs it dropped. Its precision was unparalleled at the time, making it a key player in the Blitzkrieg strategy. The Heinkel He 111, initially designed as a civilian airliner in the early 1930s, was quickly adapted for military use. It was the Luftwaffe's primary medium bomber during the early stages of World War II. Capable of carrying up to 2,000 kilograms, 4,400 pounds of bombs, it played a crucial role in campaigns from the bombing of Warsaw in 1939 to the Battle of Britain in 1940. Its distinctive design, 
with a pioneering greenhouse-style cockpit, made it one of the war's most recognizable bombers. The Messerschmitt May 262 represented a quantum leap in aviation technology. First flown under jet power in 1942 and introduced in 1944, it was the first operational jet-powered fighter aircraft. Its speed and armament, including 430 mm MK 108 cannons, made it a formidable adversary. Willy Messerschmitt's design was so advanced that it influenced jet aircraft development long after the war. Though its impact was limited by late deployment and logistical issues, it marked the dawn of the jet age. The rocket-powered Messerschmitt Me 163 Comet, introduced in 1944, was another example of the Luftwaffe's innovative spirit. Designed by Alexander Lippisch, this interceptor was the fastest aircraft of the war, reaching speeds over 1,000 km per h, 621 miles per hour. Its operational use was limited and risky, but it demonstrated Germany's willingness to push the boundaries of conventional aircraft design. Aces High, Chronicles of the Luftwaffe's Elite. The Luftwaffe's aces of World War II were more than just pilots. They were masters of the sky, whose aerial feats became the stuff of legend. Their stories are interwoven with extraordinary skill, tactical brilliance, and a relentless pursuit of victory. Among them, Erich Hartmann, dubbed the Black Devil by his Soviet adversaries, stands out as the most successful fighter ace in the history of aerial warfare. Erich Hartmann's career is a saga of extraordinary skill and relentless determination. Born in 1922, Hartmann joined the Luftwaffe in 1940 and quickly established himself as a formidable pilot. Flying the Messerschmitt BF-109, he achieved his first aerial victory in November 1942. From then on, his tally of downed enemy aircraft rose meteorically. Hartmann's technique was unique. He preferred to close in very close to his target before firing, ensuring a high probability of a kill. His incredible record of 352 confirmed kills, achieved over 1,404 combat missions, remains unmatched to this day. Hartmann's famous quote, I never felt that I shot down a plane, I only shot at a piece of equipment, I was just doing my duty, reflects his professional approach to the grim task of aerial combat. Hartmann was taken prisoner by the Soviets at the end of the war and wasn't released until 1955. His legacy is a blend of aerial prowess and the harsh realities of war. Gerhard Barkhorn, standing second only to Hartmann, achieved 301 victories in his career. Born on March 20, 1919, in Königsberg, Serving on the Eastern Front, Barkhorn flew the Fokker Wolf FW-190 and the Messerschmitt BF-109. His flying career was marked by a combination of skill and patience, with his victories accumulated over several years. Barkhorn's statement, I had to do my duty as a fighter pilot, reflects the stoic sense of duty that characterized many of these pilots. Gunther Rohl, with 275 aerial victories, was another notable figure. He achieved his impressive tally in just over 600 combat missions, primarily on the Eastern Front. Rawls' skill as a pilot was complemented by his leadership qualities, which saw him command several fighter wings. His remarkable comeback after breaking his back in a crash in 1941, only to return to flying and continue his streak of victories, is a testament to his tenacity. Roll's perspective on his experience is captured in his words. We fought for our loved ones, for our survival, and in defense of our homeland. Werner Mulders was a pioneer among fighter aces. Born on March 18, 1913, in Gelsenkirchen, Mulders was instrumental in developing the Finger 4 formation, a tactic that enhanced both offensive capability and defensive security. His 115 victories were remarkable for their time. Moulders, who once said, What I have achieved is not due to my skill as a pilot, but to my personal courage, died in a flying accident in 1941, leaving behind a legacy of tactical innovation. Hans Joachim Marseille, the star of Africa, was renowned for his extraordinary success against the British in North Africa. Born on December 13, 1919 in Berlin, Marseille was a pilot who combined aggressive tactics 
with a flamboyant personality. His 158 victories, achieved with remarkable marksmanship, were testament to his skill. Marseille, known for saying, I see and I shoot, that's my way, tragically died in a flying accident in 1942. Veiled in secrecy, the Luftwaffe's pursuit of experimental might. In the annals of World War II, the Luftwaffe's secret weapons and experimental aircraft projects stand out as a testament to innovation under pressure. Despite the constraints of war, German engineers and scientists embarked on ambitious projects to develop advanced weaponry and aircraft, some of which were far ahead of their time. One of the most intriguing projects was the Horton Ho 229, often regarded as a precursor to modern stealth technology. Designed by the Horton brothers Reimar and Walter, the Ho 229 was a flying wing aircraft, notable for its blended wing body design, which gave it a distinct, almost futuristic appearance. The first prototype flew in 1944 and showed promise with its low radar signature and high speed, powered by two Junkers Jumo 004 jet engines. Although it never saw combat, the Ho 229 was a leap forward in aerodynamic design and had the potential to significantly impact air warfare if it had been developed earlier. Reimar Horton once reflected, Our flying wing was not just one of many, it was the first to fly, and it flew. Another remarkable project was the Messerschmitt Mi-262, the world's first operational jet-powered fighter aircraft. First flown in 1942 and introduced in 1944, it represented a major technological advancement. With speeds reaching up to 870 km per h, 540 miles per hour, it was significantly faster than any Allied piston engine aircraft. The Mi-262 was equipped with 430mm Mk-108 cannons and could also carry rockets or bombs, making it a formidable adversary. However, its late introduction and the challenges of jet engine maintenance limited its impact on the war. Adolf Galland, a famous Luftwaffe general, criticised this decision, saying, it was as if an eagle had been turned into a plowshare. The Luftwaffe also ventured into rocket-powered flight, with the Messerschmitt Mi-163 Comet, the only rocket-powered fighter aircraft ever to be operational. Designed by Alexander Lippisch, its first powered flight was in 1941, and it entered service in 1944. The Mi-163 was incredibly fast, reaching speeds over 1,000 km per h, 621 miles per hour, but it was plagued by numerous practical problems, including limited fuel capacity and high landing speeds, which made it a risky aircraft for pilots. Werner Baumgart, one of its test pilots, described flying the Comet as riding on a cannonball. The Arado R 234 Blitz Lightning was another groundbreaking design. As the first operational jet-powered bomber, it first flew in 1943 and entered service in 1944. With its ability to outrun piston engine fighters of the time, the R-234 was used for reconnaissance and bombing missions. Its versatility and speed were impressive, but like many of the Luftwaffe's advanced projects, it was hampered by the late stage of the war and limited production numbers. Its pilot, Erich Sommer, noted its potential, stating, it was a pilot's dream, fast and powerful. The Heinkel He 162, Volksjäger, People's Fighter, was a last-ditch effort to turn the tide of the war. A jet-powered fighter with a wooden fuselage to save on strategic materials, it was designed to be simple enough for mass production by semi-skilled labour. First flown in December 1944, the He 162 was remarkably agile, but its rush development led to several operational issues. Heinkel himself remarked, it was an aircraft glued and screwed together in haste. Beyond these aircraft, the Luftwaffe experimented with various other technologies, including guided missiles and advanced anti-aircraft systems. The Fritz X, one of the first precision-guided munitions, was used effectively against Allied ships in the Mediterranean. The development of the Wasserfall and Rheintochter surface-to-air missiles was another attempt to counter the increasing Allied air superiority though these projects did not reach operational status before the war's end. Wings and Wills 
the untold story of women in the Luftwaffe. In the narrative of World War II, the role of women in the Luftwaffe often remains a less explored chapter. While the traditional image of the Luftwaffe is male-dominated, women played significant and varied roles within this branch of the German military, from support functions to being pioneering aviators. The Luftwaffe's reliance on women grew significantly as the war progressed. Women were enlisted for various support roles, including as assistants in anti-aircraft units known as flak helpers, signal operators, and in the maintenance and repair of aircraft. Their contributions were not just auxiliary, but essential, particularly as the male workforce was depleted due to the war's demands. In Berlin alone, women constituted a substantial portion of the anti-aircraft units by 1943. These women worked tirelessly, often under harsh and dangerous conditions, proving their worth in a traditionally male-dominated environment. One of the most prominent figures symbolizing women's involvement in the Luftwaffe was Hannah Reich, one of Nazi Germany's most celebrated test pilots. Born on March 29, 1912, in Hirschberg, Silesia, Reich was a trailblazer in a field dominated by men. Her flying career began in the 1930s, and she soon became known for her skill and daring. During the war, Reich was involved in testing some of the Luftwaffe's most innovative and dangerous aircraft, including the rocket-powered Messerschmitt May 163 Comet and the V-1 Flying Bomb. In recognition of her contributions, she was awarded the Iron Cross First Class, a rare honor for a woman at the time. Reich's legacy, however, is complex. A committed Nazi and an admirer of Hitler, her achievements in aviation were overshadowed by her association with the regime. Her quote, It was the most beautiful time of my life. Those who call us traitors do not understand the love that binds us to the fatherland, reflects her unwavering allegiance to Nazi Germany. Melitta Schenk Grafin von Stauffenberg, another notable figure, was an aeronautical engineer and test pilot. She undertook hazardous dive bombing tests, contributing to the development of the Luftwaffe's aircraft. Despite being of partial Jewish descent, von Stauffenberg's aviation skills were so valued that she was awarded an honorary Aryan status. She conducted over 2,500 test flights, demonstrating remarkable bravery and skill. Her death in 1945, when her plane was shot down, was a stark reminder of the dangers these women faced. After the war, the contributions of these women largely faded into obscurity. The disbandment of the Luftwaffe and the stigma associated with the Nazi regime meant that their stories were seldom told. Yet the roles they played, from supporting ground operations to testing cutting-edge aircraft, were integral to the Luftwaffe's war effort. Shadows in the skies, the Luftwaffe, and the legacy of controversy. The Luftwaffe, a key instrument of Nazi Germany's military might during World War II, was embroiled in a series of moral and legal controversies, including accusations of war crimes. These issues remain a complex and contentious part of its legacy, reflecting the darker aspects of aerial warfare and the broader ethical dilemmas of the war. At the forefront of these controversies was the Luftwaffe's involvement in strategic bombing campaigns that often targeted civilian areas raising questions about the distinction between military and civilian targets in wartime. The Blitz, a sustained bombing campaign against British cities from 1940 to 1941, was a stark example of the Luftwaffe's strategy impacting civilians. London, subjected to 57 consecutive nights of bombing, suffered approximately 20,000 civilian deaths. The destruction of historic cities like Coventry on November 14, 1940, where a devastating air raid caused widespread destruction, exemplified the indiscriminate nature of the Luftwaffe's bombings. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, in response to the Blitz, famously declared, He, Hitler, has sown the wind, and he will reap the whirlwind. Despite such devastation, the Blitz is often cited as a factor that strengthened British resolve rather than diminishing it. Another significant controversy involved the Luftwaffe's role in the Eastern Front, particularly in the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa in 1941 saw the Luftwaffe engage in extensive bombing of Soviet cities and infrastructure, 
contributing to immense civilian suffering. The Luftwaffe's involvement in the siege of Leningrad, which resulted in the death of over a million civilians due to starvation and bombardment, is one of the most tragic episodes of this campaign. The scale and brutality of the operations on the Eastern Front have led to debates over the extent of the Luftwaffe's complicity in war crimes committed in the region. The Luftwaffe also faced accusations regarding its treatment of captured enemy airmen. There were instances where Luftwaffe personnel were implicated in the mistreatment and killing of downed Allied pilots. Such acts violated the Geneva Convention's stipulations regarding the treatment of prisoners of war. One notable incident was the murder of 50 captured Royal Air Force officers who had participated in the Great Escape from Stalag Luft III in 1944. Although the direct involvement of Luftwaffe personnel in these killings was not established, the incident highlighted the brutal nature of the war and the blurred lines of responsibility and accountability. The Luftwaffe's higher command, including Hermann Göring, often maintained a stance of detachment from such actions, with Göring famously stating, I know nothing, I see nothing, I hear nothing. The Luftwaffe's support of operations such as the bombing of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War in 1937, carried out by its Condor Legion, further tainted its reputation. The attack on the Basque town, involving widespread bombing and strafing of civilian targets, was one of the first aerial bombings to gain international infamy and was immortalized in Pablo Picasso's painting, Guernica. This incident foreshadowed the destructive potential of aerial warfare against civilian populations. Moreover, there were complexities within the Luftwaffe's own ranks. While many members were ardent supporters of the Nazi regime, others were not as ideologically aligned. Figures such as Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, and Adolf Galland, a respected fighter ace, embodied these contradictions. Göring, a leading Nazi official, was convicted of war crimes at the Nuremberg trials. In contrast, Galland, known for his professionalism and combat prowess, often clashed with Nazi leadership over military strategy and was not implicated in war crimes. Thunder against the Eagles, the Allied anti-aircraft arsenal of Wutu. In the vast theater of World War II, the Allies faced a daunting challenge, countering the formidable Luftwaffe, Germany's air force. To protect cities, factories and troops from the aerial onslaught, a diverse array of anti-aircraft weapons became an integral part of the Allied arsenal. This narrative explores the key anti-aircraft weapons that played a critical role in blunting the Luftwaffe's edge. The British 3.7-inch anti-aircraft gun, introduced in 1938, stood as a symbol of defiance. During the Luftwaffe's relentless blitz from September 7, 1940, these guns, stationed in key cities like London, Birmingham and Liverpool, were a common sight. Their impact was measurable. On the night of May 10, 1941, they were instrumental in disrupting a massive raid on London, bringing down numerous German bombers. As one Londoner remarked, the sound of the ACAC was our lullaby. This phrase captures the mix of fear and reassurance the guns provided. Across the Atlantic, the United States developed the M190MM anti-aircraft gun. Entering service in 1943, this weapon combined a high muzzle velocity with a ceiling of over 30,000 feet, making it an effective tool against high-altitude bombers. The M1's adaptability saw it mounted on ships and used as an anti-tank weapon, showcasing the versatility demanded by the multifaceted nature of the war. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, reflecting on their importance, stated, the swift, sure power of anti-aircraft fire is what stands between us and the dominance of the enemy in the air. Another key piece in the Allied arsenal was the Bofors 40mm anti-aircraft gun. A Swedish design adopted by both British and American forces, the Bofors became renowned for its reliability and rapid-fire capability. Deployed on both land and sea, it filled the gap between smaller caliber machine guns and the larger artillery pieces, effectively engaging low-flying aircraft and dive bombers. During the Battle of Midway in June 1942, these guns played a critical role in defending against Japanese air attacks, contributing to a pivotal American victory. 
The Allies also relied heavily on smaller caliber weapons, like the Ehrlichon 20mm cannon. Fast and maneuverable, the Ehrlichon was a favorite aboard naval vessels and in ground-based roles, providing a last line of defense against strafing runs and low-level attacks. But the anti-aircraft defense was not just about hardware. Radar, a revolutionary technology, played a pivotal role. The British Chain Home Radar System, operational by 1939, gave early warning of incoming raids, allowing anti-aircraft batteries to be more effectively deployed and coordinated. This technological edge was a game-changer, stripping the Luftwaffe of the element of surprise. Sir Winston Churchill, in tribute to this technological marvel, said, the radar screen was the shield and the sword. Historical accounts often highlight the valiant efforts of anti-aircraft crews during significant air raids. For instance, during the Luftwaffe's ferocious attack on Malta in 1942, the island's anti-aircraft defences, despite being heavily outnumbered, managed to inflict substantial losses on German and Italian aircraft, earning Malta the moniker the Fortress Island. These anti-aircraft systems, though crucial, were not infallible. The Luftwaffe's introduction of jet-powered aircraft like the Messerschmitt May 262 brought new challenges, as these faster planes often flew at speeds and altitudes that stretched the limits of existing anti-aircraft technology. General Eisenhower, reflecting on the importance of air defence, once remarked, The gunners have been the stalwart and steadfast defenders of the infantry in this war. This sentiment encapsulates the integral role anti-aircraft units played in the Allied war effort. Aerial rivals, the Luftwaffe and Allied air forces in World War II. World War II witnessed a colossal struggle in the skies, where the Luftwaffe and the Allied air forces clashed, each bringing distinct strategies, aircraft and levels of effectiveness. This contrast in aerial warfare tactics and technology played a pivotal role in shaping the conflict's outcome. The Allied air forces, comprising primarily the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Forces, evolved their strategies over the war's course. The RAF, under the leadership of figures like Sir Arthur Harris, who famously stated, The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everyone else, and nobody was going to bomb them. Embraced strategic bombing, targeting German industrial centers and civilian infrastructure in an effort to cripple the Nazi war machine. The Avro Lancaster bomber, introduced in 1942, became a symbol of this strategy, capable of delivering Grand Slam bombs weighing 22,000 pounds. The USAAF's B-17 Flying Fortress, with its debut in 1935, and the B-24 Liberator, introduced in 1941, were central to the daylight bombing campaigns over Germany, significantly disrupting German industry and infrastructure. The Battle of Britain in 1940 was a defining moment in the air war. The Luftwaffe's objective to gain air superiority over England was met with staunch resistance from the RAF. Equipped with the Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire, the RAF successfully repelled the Luftwaffe's attacks. The Spitfire, in particular, became an icon of British resilience, matching or surpassing the BF-109 in combat. The battle demonstrated the importance of radar technology, an area where the Allies had an edge, and the criticality of fighting over friendly territory, which allowed the RAF to quickly refuel, rearm, and re-engage. On the Eastern Front, the Luftwaffe faced the vast Soviet Air Force. Initially suffering heavy losses, the Soviets gradually improved both in the quality of aircraft and tactics. Soviet planes like the Yakovlev Yak-3 and the Ilyushin Il-2 Sturmovik, though less sophisticated than their German counterparts, were rugged and effective in their respective roles of fighter and ground attack. The entry of the United States into the war brought significant changes. The USAAF's long-range escort fighters, particularly the P-51 Mustang, addressed a crucial gap in the Allies' strategy. The Mustang, with its exceptional range and performance, provided vital protection for bombing raids deep into German territory, significantly reducing losses. Hermann Göring, commander of the Luftwaffe, reportedly said upon seeing the Mustangs over Berlin, I knew then that the war was lost. The Luftwaffe's decline, 
and the Allied Air Force's rise were influenced by several factors. The Luftwaffe's initial focus on short-range tactical support limited its strategic bombing capabilities, a gap that the Allies exploited. Additionally, the Allies' superior industrial capacity allowed for rapid advancements in aircraft technology and production. Innovations like radar-guided bombing introduced by the Allies further tilted the balance. This technological edge was exemplified in the development of the British window radar countermeasures and the American H-2X radar system. Clash in the clouds, the Luftwaffe's struggle in the Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain, a critical aerial conflict of World War II lasting from July to October 1940, was a dramatic confrontation between the Luftwaffe and the Royal Air Force. Commanded by Hermann Göring, the Luftwaffe embarked on this campaign with a robust fleet, including the Messerschmitt Bf 109 and the Heinkel He 111, expecting a swift victory. Their initial strategy targeted British airfields and radar stations, aiming to cripple the RAF's defensive capabilities in preparation for Operation Sea Lion, the planned invasion of Britain. In the early days of the battle, the Luftwaffe seemed to be fulfilling its objective. RAF airfields, especially in southeastern England, faced relentless bombardment. On August 13, 1940, known as Eagle Day, the Luftwaffe launched a massive assault, marking the beginning of a full-scale offensive. However, the resilience of the RAF, flying hurricanes and spitfires, gradually began to challenge the Luftwaffe's dominance. The British pilots, although outnumbered, were fighting over their homeland, giving them a strategic advantage. Hugh Dowding, the head of RAF Fighter Command, strategically managed his limited resources, focusing on quick, targeted responses to German attacks. The hardest day, on August 18, 1940, marked a significant turning point. This day witnessed intense aerial combat with both sides suffering substantial losses. The Luftwaffe lost about 69 aircraft and the RAF lost 68. The Luftwaffe's focus on airfields and radar installations, though initially successful, was not as decisive as anticipated. The determination of the RAF was encapsulated by Churchill's famous words, never was so much owed by so many to so few. The Luftwaffe's strategic blunder came into sharp focus following the accidental bombing of London on August 24, 1940, and the consequent retaliatory bombing of Berlin by the RAF. Hitler's enraged directive to bomb London, a shift from military to civilian targets, marked the beginning of the Blitz. This change inadvertently eased the pressure on RAF airfields, allowing them to recover and rebuild. The bombing of London, while causing significant civilian casualties and damage, did not achieve the strategic aim of breaking British morale. Instead, it galvanised British resistance, a sentiment echoed in Churchill's speech. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. The Luftwaffe faced tactical challenges as the battle progressed. The limited range of the BF-109 fighters, which could only escort bombers over England for a brief period, was a significant disadvantage. In contrast, the RAF, operating from nearby bases, could quickly refuel and rejoin the fight. The British radar system, Chain Home, provided early warnings of incoming attacks, allowing the RAF to effectively mobilize their defenses. By September 1940, the Luftwaffe's inability to secure air superiority became evident. Despite their numerical superiority, the Germans were unable to inflict a decisive defeat on the RAF. The high losses incurred by the Luftwaffe, coupled with the resilient defense of the RAF, led to the postponement and eventual cancellation of Operation Sea Lion. The Battle of Britain was a significant blow to Hitler's expansionist ambitions and the first major setback for the Luftwaffe. Blitzkrieg from above, the Luftwaffe's bombing onslaught. The Luftwaffe's bombing campaigns in World War II were a demonstration of raw power and strategic intent. These campaigns, spanning various European theatres, were a mix of tactical precision and indiscriminate destruction, leaving a lasting impact on the war's trajectory. The onslaught began with the invasion of Poland on September 1, 1939. 
The Luftwaffe's bombers, such as the Heinkel He 111 and the Junkers Ju 87 Stuka, rained destruction upon Warsaw, causing significant civilian casualties. This attack was not just a military operation, but a psychological tactic intended to break the will of the Polish resistance. The bombing of Warsaw, where over 1,000 tons of bombs were dropped, set a precedent for the Luftwaffe's future campaigns. Hermann Göring, the architect of this aerial strategy, boasted, Our Luftwaffe will play a decisive role in the victory. The Blitz, which lasted from September 7, 1940 to May 11, 1941, saw the Luftwaffe carry out sustained night bombings on London and other British cities, including Coventry, Birmingham, Liverpool and Manchester. Initially aimed at RAF airfields and radar installations, the accidental bombing of London on August 24, 1940, triggered a retaliatory British raid on Berlin. Infuriated, Hitler ordered a concentrated bombing campaign against British cities. The Luftwaffe unleashed a series of night bombings, with London enduring 57 consecutive nights of attacks. Coventry, bombed on November 14, 1940, became synonymous with the horrors of aerial bombardment, suffering extensive damage and civilian casualties. The scale of destruction was immense, with the Blitz resulting in over 40,000 civilian deaths. Yet, as Winston Churchill declared, the British nation is stirred to anger and resolve. In the East, the Luftwaffe's role in Operation Barbarossa in 1941 marked another brutal chapter. Cities like Leningrad and Stalingrad were subjected to relentless bombings. The bombing of Stalingrad, starting in August 1942, turned the city into a fiery inferno, setting the stage for one of the war's most brutal battles. Despite the Luftwaffe's initial successes, the harsh Russian winter and resilient Soviet defense took their toll. The Luftwaffe's strategy often involved targeting civilians, an approach designed to demoralize the enemy, but which frequently had the opposite effect. The bombing of Belgrade on April 6, 1941, where hundreds were killed, and the devastating attack on Rotterdam on May 14, 1940, prompting Dutch surrender, are stark examples of this tactic. Goering's assertion, we shall go down in history as the greatest statesmen of all time, or as their greatest criminals, reflected the controversial nature of these campaigns. Throughout the war, the Luftwaffe continued to innovate in its bombing tactics and technology. The introduction of the Fritz X, one of the first precision-guided munitions, was used effectively against the Italian battleship Roma in 1943. However, the diminishing resources, the Allies' improving air defences and strategic missteps eventually eroded the Luftwaffe's bombing capabilities. Between desert and frost, the Luftwaffe's varied fronts in World War II. The Luftwaffe's operations during World War II on the Eastern Front and in North Africa showcased the versatility and limits of Germany's air power. These campaigns, starkly contrasting in environment and challenges, were crucibles that tested the Luftwaffe's strength and strategy. In the deserts of North Africa, the Luftwaffe entered the fray in 1941 to support the Africa Corps, commanded by the Desert Fox, Irvin Rommel. The arid conditions of Libya and Egypt posed unique challenges, with sandstorms and extreme heat affecting aircraft maintenance and performance. Aircraft like the Messerschmitt Bf 109 and the Junkers Ju 87 Stuka were essential in providing close air support. The Stuka, in particular, with its terrifying dive-bombing siren, became a feared symbol of German air superiority. However, the Battle of El Alamein in late 1942, where the Luftwaffe strived to support Rommel's ground operations, marked a turning point. The Luftwaffe, struggling with long supply lines and growing Allied air strength, ultimately failed to prevent the Axis defeat. Rommel himself acknowledged the importance of air superiority, saying, the battle is fought, and decided by the quartermasters before the shooting begins. On the Eastern Front, Operation Barbarossa in June 1941 marked the beginning of a brutal and vast campaign. The Luftwaffe launched extensive bombing raids against Soviet targets, achieving initial success. However, the harsh Russian winter, the vastness of the Soviet Union, and the unexpectedly strong resistance of the Soviet forces posed severe problems. The Luftwaffe's involvement in the Siege of Leningrad, 
and the catastrophic Battle of Stalingrad, where they attempted an aerial resupply of the encircled 6th Army in the winter of 1942, highlighted the limits of air power in such harsh conditions. The failure at Stalingrad, leading to the surrender of the 6th Army, was a significant blow, with Goering erroneously assuring Hitler, my Luftwaffe is invincible. In North Africa, the Luftwaffe's operations were further complicated by the need to control the Mediterranean. The siege of Malta, a crucial British stronghold, became a focal point. Despite repeated bombing campaigns in 1942, the Luftwaffe could not neutralize the island, significantly impacting their operations in Africa. The failure to secure Malta was a strategic blunder that hindered the Luftwaffe's effectiveness in supporting Rommel's campaign. The Eastern Front's vast distances and extreme weather exacerbated the Luftwaffe's logistical challenges. The Battle of Kursk in July 1943, despite the deployment of a large number of Luftwaffe aircraft, showcased the diminishing impact of German air power against well-prepared Soviet defences. The Soviets' increasingly effective anti-aircraft systems and the growing capability of the Red Air Force posed significant challenges. The Luftwaffe's inability to provide decisive support at Kursk was a telling sign of its declining influence on the Eastern Front. Throughout these campaigns, the Luftwaffe's personnel demonstrated exceptional skill and resilience. However, they faced constant challenges, including the high attrition rate of pilots and aircraft. Fuel and spare parts shortages became increasingly acute as the war progressed. The Luftwaffe's initial superiority gradually eroded leaving them unable to maintain air superiority against the Allies. The Luftwaffe's shadow, from history to popular media. The Luftwaffe, the aerial warfare branch of the German Wehrmacht during World War II, has been a subject of enduring fascination in popular culture. Its portrayal in films, books, video games and other media forms has evolved over the years, often reflecting the complexities and controversies surrounding its historical role. In cinema, the Luftwaffe has often been depicted as a formidable force, with films focusing on both its technological advancements and the human stories of its pilots. One of the earliest examples is The Battle of Britain, 1969, a film that offers a dramatized account of the famous 1940 air battle. Featuring scenes with aircraft like the Messerschmitt BF-109 and the Heinkel He-111, the film blends historical detail with compelling storytelling. More recently, Dunkirk, 2017, by Christopher Nolan, portrays the Luftwaffe's role in the 1940 Dunkirk evacuation, showcasing intense aerial dogfights that underscore the terror and chaos of war. Literature has also delved into the narrative of the Luftwaffe. Books like The First and the Last, 1954, by Adolf Galland, a Luftwaffe general, provide an insider's perspective on the Air Force's operations and tactics. Meanwhile, novels such as Piece of Cake, 1983, by Derek Robinson, offer fictional accounts that are rich in historical detail, painting a vivid picture of the air battles over Europe. The Luftwaffe's impact extends to video games, where it is often portrayed with a mix of historical accuracy and creative liberty. Titles like Isle 2 Sturmovik, 2001, and the War Thunder series present players with detailed simulations of Luftwaffe aircraft, allowing them to experience the intensity of W-2 aerial combat. These games, while primarily entertainment, also serve as interactive platforms for understanding the technological aspects and challenges of wartime aviation. Documentaries and television series have contributed significantly to the portrayal of the Luftwaffe. The documentary, The World at War, 1973-74, to 74, provides a comprehensive historical account of W-2, including insightful analyses of the Luftwaffe's strategy and effectiveness. Television series like Dogfights, 2006-2008, to 2008, use CGI to recreate famous aerial battles involving the Luftwaffe, bringing a new level of visual detail and excitement to historical events. In toys and models, the Luftwaffe has also left its mark. Scale models of aircraft like the Focke-Wulf Fuddle W-190 and the Junkers U-87 have been popular among hobbyists, reflecting an interest in the technical aspects of these machines. These models, while recreational, 
often lead enthusiasts to a deeper exploration of the history and design of Wauti II aircraft. Phoenix from the Ashes, the rebirth of the German Air Force. In the aftermath of World War II, Germany faced the colossal task of rebuilding its military under the watchful eyes of the Allied powers. The reformation and evolution of the German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, post-1945, is a story of resurgence, transformation and grappling with a complex legacy. After the war, Germany was left in ruins, both physically and politically. The Luftwaffe, once a symbol of German military prowess, was dissolved following Germany's unconditional surrender. The terms of the Potsdam Agreement and subsequent disarmament policies prohibited Germany from having an air force. For nearly a decade, Germany remained without an air force, while the memories of the Luftwaffe's role in the war lingered in the public consciousness. The turning point came with the Cold War's escalation. The perceived threat from the Soviet Union prompted Western powers to reconsider their stance on German rearmament. In 1955, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, became a sovereign state and joined NATO. This pivotal moment marked the beginning of the new German Air Force's formation, known as the Luftwaffe, a name it inherited from its predecessor, despite the historical baggage associated with it. The reformed Luftwaffe's early years were focused on establishing a defensive air capability aligned with NATO's strategic needs. The introduction of aircraft, like the American-made F-84 Thunderjet and later the F-104 Starfighter, represented a new era in German aviation. These aircraft were leaps and bounds ahead of the propeller-driven planes of the World War II era, signifying a shift towards modern air warfare. However, the F-104 Starfighter, dubbed the Widowmaker, was mired in controversy due to a high number of crashes, raising questions about the haste in rebuilding the Luftwaffe. The German Minister of Defence, Franz Josef Strauss, defended the decision, stating, The F-104 is the best fighter-bomber in the world. The 1960s and 1970s saw the Luftwaffe continue to grow and modernise. The introduction of the F-4 Phantom II and the Tornado in the 1980s further enhanced its capabilities. The Luftwaffe also started participating in international missions, signifying a shift from a purely defensive posture to a more active role in global security. The Eurofighter Typhoon, introduced in the early 2000s, epitomised this modernisation, showcasing advanced technology and multi-role capabilities. The Luftwaffe's involvement in international missions marked a significant departure from its past. In the 1990s, the Luftwaffe participated in operations in the Balkans, enforcing no-fly zones and providing humanitarian aid. This role continued into the 21st century with involvement in Afghanistan and the fight against ISIS, reflecting Germany's commitment to international peacekeeping and security. As the sun set on May 8, 1945, marking the end of World War II in Europe, the legacy of the Luftwaffe lay in the rubble of a continent scarred by conflict. From the aggressive blitzkrieg tactics that stunned the world in the late 1930s to the desperate defensive battles in the skies over Germany in the war's final days, the Luftwaffe's story is one of rapid ascent and dramatic fall. In the words of Winston Churchill, the era of procrastination, of half-measures, of soothing and baffling expedients of delays is coming to its close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. The Luftwaffe's story, fraught with both ingenuity and tragedy, serves as a stark reminder of those consequences, echoing through history as a testament to the heights of innovation and the depths of warfare.